we're really, really glad to have you all here and sorry for the slight delay. I'm, I'm gonna keep my introduction super short. Um, and, and then I'm gonna introduce my colleague, Rob Fishman, who will give the introduction of our esteemed guest, Professor Richard Lazarus. Uh, so um, I, I really am glad that you're here for the Ralph F. Fuchs Lecture. Uh, Ralph, the, the, the Fuchs Lectureship in Law was established more than 20 years ago to honor the memory of Professor Ralph Fuchs. He was a distinguished and respected member of our faculty from 1945 until his death in 1985. Professor Fuchs was an accomplished teacher and a pioneering scholar in the area of administrative law, but he was equally well known for his lifelong commitment to public service and for the dedication, creativity, and compassion that he brought to his work. He was the first chairman of the executive board of the Indiana Civil Liberties Union. He was also an active member of the NAACP uh, and was appointed to the State Most Committee Redress. on Legal Redress for the NAACP. He was, a deeply, he was deeply committed to defending the rights of free speech, free press, and free assembly in the university context, eventually becoming president of the American, Univers American Association of University Professors. The yearly Fuchs Lecture, in many ways, is a cornerstone to the wide-ranging series of public service work that goes on here at the law school and its program generally. Um, whether we're thinking about the work that's done through our live clinics or through our pro bono projects or through the work of our vibrant student organizations and the thousands of hours of pro bono uh, uh, work that our students put in every year. Uh, that work uh, makes a tremendous difference to those who need legal services the most. Uh, and as we all know, public service is a critical component of a lawyer's life. And the Fuchs Lecture every year affords us an opportunity to learn how the law influences the public good. The past few lec Fuchs lecturers have included some of the nation's top and le top legal scholars with a deep commitment to public service. They include Sir David Williams of Cambridge University, William B. Gould, for the former chairman of the National Labor Relations Board, Morris Dees, who is a civil rights lawyer and co-founder of the Civil Liberty, the Southern Poverty Law Center, and last year, UCLA professor uh, Ingrid Early. And as you know, today we are joined by the esteemed and illustrious Professor Richard Lazarus. I'm gonna let my colleague, Rob Fishman, uh, um, provide a more thorough introduction of Professor Lazarus. Thanks, Rob. Thank you, Dean Ochoa. Um, I've got a particularly challenging task ahead because the Fuchs Lecture is uh, something that is designed to emphasize public service. Uh, and with all of our lecturers, there is a lot to say about our speaker's scholarship and his contribution to thinking and construction of environmental law. But I really would like to emphasize the public service aspect because that is uh, a particular focus of the legacy of Professor Fuchs and is a really important uh, part of the legacy of Richard Lazarus. Lazarus started as an academic, having come from what we today call the Environment and Natural Resources Division of the US Department of Justice. So he brought a kind of focus on representing federal agencies. Throughout the course of his teaching career, though, he has taken the time first to do a, I think, couple of year term at the Solicitor General's office to uh, represent the United States before the US Supreme Court, but then to take on clients, states, local governments, environmental groups that were litigating cases before the high court. He has represented about 40 of those institutions before the Supreme Court and made the oral arguments in 14 of those cases. Um, and one could easily see then how I would be introducing someone who's principally known as a litigator activist as a form of public service. But it doesn't end there. After the uh, tragic catastrophe in the Gulf of Mexico in 2010, when BP's Deepwater Horizon drilling rig exploded with loss of life and subsequent destruction of marine resources in the Gulf, uh, Professor Lazarus took on the task to be executive director of the commission that had been established, I think principally to look at the proximate causes of 
the explosion and the oil spill and to think through how to avoid that from happening in the future. But partly because of his leadership, the commission's report was far broader than that. And as a result of the report, we have a completely different um, institutional setup for implementing the offshore oil and gas laws, separating out entities that are principally responsible for the leasing from those entities that are principally responsible for uh, collecting revenue and separating those from the entities that are principally responsible for safeguarding the environment in the course of drilling for oil in the Gulf of Mexico. Partly for those activities and partly for his scholarship, the ABA awarded Professor Lazarus the Distinguished uh, Achievement in Environmental Law Award. I would like to say personally that um, it was first and foremost Professor Lazarus's publications that really inspired me uh, when I came to uh, Mauer in uh, 1992. Professor Lazarus was uh, the first scholar to challenge what was then and still really is the conventional wisdom that the public trust doctrine is a kind of unalloyed uh, golden ticket for uh, environmental protection. Uh, he was one of the first scholars to note the distributional inequities in implementation of environmental law and promote environmental justice first in permitting and then in other sorts of programs that are part of the implementation of environmental law. He's written about um, criminal culpability in environmental law. Again, all this starting in the 1990s, you know, before we had the uh, criminal culpability of the uh, Flint water crisis. I uh, wrote about the tragedy of distrust between the Environmental Protection Agency and Congress in the, 19, in the early 90s, when I'm sure he thought that the Reagan administration was the low water mark of uh, problems with uh, EPA implementation of congressional uh, intent. And uh, that's, that's just scratching the surface. Today, he will uh, talk about his revision of what has become a standard reference for the history of US environmental law, the making of environmental law. A, a revised edition is coming out this year. If you like this lecture, you should certainly take a look at the book he published uh, less than three years ago called The uh, Rule of Five, which is a gripping account of what happened behind the scenes in the advocacy leading up to the Supreme Court's decision in Massachusetts versus the Environmental Protection Agency, which established that greenhouse gases can be pollutants regulable under the Clean Air Act. Just a quick note that, um, of, of course, Professor Lazarus is beloved here at Indiana University because he started his career as an assistant professor at the law school. Of course, today he is far distant from being an assistant professor at the apex of the hierarchy of law schools as a, a chaired professor at Harvard Law School. But I would tell you that both from my personal experience and from the experience of people who are just starting out today in academia, Professor Lazarus is known for his kindness and generosity. Just a little over two months ago, I was at a conference with Professor Lazarus in San Diego, and I saw him spending most of his time with untenured, relatively inexperienced environmental law professors, helping them sharpen their scholarly chops so they have the same opportunities that he had through his career. I could, of course, go on, but I won't. Instead, I will simply ask you to join me in welcoming the Howard and Catherine Abel Professor of Law from Harvard University, Richard J. Lazarus. Lots to cover. Um, really so much fun to be back here. Uh, uh, it's been a, a while. Uh, as uh, Rob mentioned, I, I started my career here in August of 1983, um, a little younger than I am now, as you'll see in just a moment. But when I was in, invited to give this 
lecture. First, I just was invited to give the, a talk. I said, I'd be happy to do it. And then I learned it was the Ralph, oh, let's see. Yeah. It was a Ralph Hughes lecture. And then I was ecstatic because I knew Ralph Fuchs. I'm like almost anyone here. Uh, when I showed up in August 1983 at Indiana University uh, in my 20s, I was 28, um, I looked about eight. And I was in my office with all my boxes. In walked this elderly gentleman in a dark suit, white shirt, and a tie. He introduced himself was Ralph Fuchs. Uh, and we became very close friends. Uh, he and his wife, uh, Annetta, uh, at the time. I know I haven't changed a bit. Uh, and one thing I did when I met him, and, and listen to the amazing career he had during that first year, is I decided that people at the law school didn't know about Ralph Fuchs. None of the students did. He was about 84 years old. He wasn't teaching anymore. So I organized... Uh, a group of seminars in the faculty lounge where I invited a group of students, about 15 every time, in four of them. And I interviewed Ralph about his life and his career. Listen. And finally, to your final thing on uh, the role of legal profession. But obviously, the biggest impact on me here was my was teaching. Uh, this is my first class here in fall 1983. Actually, I know where many of those students are. Um, uh, many went into environmental law uh, jobs uh, over the time. You never forget your first class uh, of, of students. I'll never, never forget Mimi Harrington because she was what we call a nodder. She'd sat right in the middle of the class I mean, you're a beginning teacher. You're like, do I know what I'm doing? Uh, and Mimi would not. It, it, it was much appreciated um, during that semester. But this is where I sort of learned to teach. This is a school that gave me a chance. Um, and I started thinking for the first time as an academic about environmental law. I had practiced environmental law. Everything I had done was environmental law. But to teach it, you have to think about it differently than to just practice in it. And I, this is a copy of my notes for my first day of teaching here. We had a thing back there called handwriting. Um, and you can see, I was trying to figure out what environmental law was, what it is. Uh, is it a distinct area of law or is just a context for other cross-cutting areas of law? Or is it a mixture of both? Or is there something distinctive about environmental law? environmental issues that affects legal doctrine and legal principles. I began that thought process here in August 1983, and 20 years later, it led to publication of this book, uh, The Making of Environmental Law in 2004, uh, trying to figure out what was environmental about environmental law and try to explain the history of environmental law from that basis. When I wrote this book, I never planned to write a second edition. I actually don't like doing the same thing again. Uh, there's so much happening in environmental law, I wanna keep going. Uh, but I decided a few years ago that so much had happened that I didn't anticipate in 2000, in the next 20 years in environmental law, that I need to go back and rethink it a bit. And that's why I published, which is just out, uh, the new edition of Making Environmental Law, which I would say is about 65% different than uh, the first edition. So what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to give you a sense of the structure of the book, 
And then I'm going to talk about four topics in the book in a little more uh, detail. So the contents basically this four part. Part one is making environmental law. Part two is the road first taken, the 20th century. Part three is the road disrupted. That's the 21st century. So much which I didn't foresee happened. Uh, and finally, some looking back and going forward uh, to the future. Um, so making environmental law, the first chapter is time, space, and ecological injury. And that's how there are certain things about environmental issues, environmental problems, environmental controversies, which make it really hard to make environmental law in the first instance and maintain it over time. And I'm gonna give you a little hint of that. Uh, the second is implications of those features of environmental disputes and pollution and natural resource and how they affect law. Uh, the next is the challenge of lawmaking institution processes, environmental protection law. Then part two looks at the 20th century, sort of becoming environmental law. What, what I decided in June, 1971, that I wanted to be an environmental lawyer. I was uh, just beginning my freshman year at the University of Illinois, uh, not far away. And I decided to get a BS in chemistry and a BA in economics. And people said to me, why are you getting a BS in chemistry and a BA in economics? I said, it's my pre-environmental law program. More often than not, people would say to me, what's that? Because it wasn't part of the lexicon. It wasn't something that people knew environmental law. It, it really wasn't a major term. EPA had just been created uh, a few months uh, before. Most of the statutes hadn't been passed at that point. Um, chapter five is building the road, the 70s. Six is spanning the road, the 80s. Seven, maintain the road, the 90s. And that's really where I left off before. Part three disrupted the 21st century. Uh, super wicked problem of climate change, which has become the environmental problem of our times, and not just our times, but the future's times. Um, looking at the George Bush administration, the Obama administration, and the Trump administration. Part four, looking back, going forward, looking for overall trends in pollution control, natural resources law, how there's been a convergence in some way and some lessons we've learned. 13 is the next 50 years, which I'll let someone else here write that book. Um, so here are my four topics. I wanna to do a little more detail on, just to dive in. One, the challenge of our law make, give you a sense of why it's hard. Uh, the second is it's dramatic emergency in the United States, how it happened anyway. Uh, it shouldn't happen but it happened. Uh, then it's surprising persistence over time. It's obituary has been written and rewritten over and over again. It just keeps coming back. Uh, and finally, climate change, uh, just because one cannot not talk about this big issue. All right, so first, the challenge of environmental lawmaking. Why is it so hard? It's a combination of two things, the laws of nature and the nature of lawmaking institutions. And how there's a mismatch between the two. I'm going to do this very simple book is a little more complicated, give you a basic sense of why. One, environmental law is incredibly complex, mind-numbingly so, because it has to reflect all the complexities of the ecosystem. Ecosystem doesn't give us the environment like a periodic table of elements, like add, a, add another, you know, hydrogen, whatever that, you get the next element. No, it's really complicated. Environmental law is really complicated. It ignores those complexities, right? It does so at its peril. But, but no less significantly, the way the ecosystem works, the way the wind blows, the way the water flows, in environmental law, what happens always is actions here and now have consequences there and then. There's a spreading out of cause and effect. And that means that environmental laws have to regulate some people activities at one place in one time for the benefit of other people at another place at another time. That's hard. They're inherently redistributional. And because of that spread out cause and effect, there's a lot of scientific uncertainty as well. And they're inherently controversial, a redistributional law. 
But that's what environmental law has to do. No government's very good at that. If you think about it, the hydrologic cycle, right? Fairly classic. Now, it's moving things. It's moving air pollution. It's moving water pollution. It's constantly, but that's not the only chemical cycle, right? There's the carbon cycle. There's the sulfur cycle. There's the nitrogen cycle. Our ecosystem is constantly moving things over time and space. And so too is pollution moving over time and space. You add to it the fact that there are certain cliffs in the ecosystem. You, you, right, you raise the temperature of the ocean just like that coral reefs die, right? I mean, they're cliffs. You make a mistake, right, boom, and you can't put it back together again. When the glaciers melt, that's it, at least, right, for our time frame. So there's a peril of waiting too long. There's a time dimension a pressing nature that you often need to act before you have all the information. Because if you wait, it may well be too late. Now you put that together, you end up with these kinds of laws. They're inherently distributive, they're complex, they're ambiguous, they're dynamic, they're uncertain, and they're precautionary. But they have to be, given the ecosystem and environmental science. You put that with our lawmaking institutions, right? It's a problem. There's no particular lawmaking system that's good at regulating the here and now for the benefit of there and then. That's a very hard thing politically to do. Ours is no better, often for good reason, right? There are reasons why it's hard. So you look at, right, we divide our government at the national level between three branches. Why? Because the framers deliberately wanted to make it hard to pass laws. They want to make it hard to pass really redistributive laws because they were right, not trusting a big government. Again, for a good reason, but that's hard for environmental law when it's all about redistribution, when it's all about trying to push often because of the borders, pushing things nationally. And the framers weren't interested in it. There's no national police power. There's state and local police power, but there's no national police power. You've got to gerrymand it to the commerce clause or the property clause. So it's just a misfit along the way. You look at every one of the branches, right? Congress, it's really hard to pass a law. It's elaborate to pass a law. Again, deliberately so. They want to make it hard to pass these laws. But that's hard for environmental law. Environmental law is dynamic. It needs constant change. It needs to move. It needs to reflect new understandings, new science, but it's hard to do that. When was the last time the Clean Air Act was amended? 1990. That's right, 33 years ago. And that's the most recent one. Water Act, 87, hazardous waste, 84, endangered species, 73. It's hard to get these things done. The executive branch is deliberately fragmented. And there are parts of those government which are concerned about the here and now. And there are parts that are a little more concerned about the there and then. It's no happenstance that all Office of Management and Budget Review for the short-term impact of regulation began right after EPA was created. It was called the Quality of Life Review, run by George Schultz at OMB under the Nixon administration because they were concerned about the here and now. They wanted that here and now to have a voice because the government cares about the here and now. So we'll see election cycles, the voters are the here and now. The there and then aren't there. We also deliberately, the framers wanted to put the power in states and local governments for good reason. And a lot of important environmental law happens there, but environmental law is also about the transboundary issue. It's not just about any one state. If you look to where a lot of environmental polluting facilities are, they are disproportionately at borders of states. There's a reason why the power plant in Indianapolis, the big one there, has such a tall stack. Why? Get it out of Indiana. That's how people respond to the Clean Act of 1970. They build a lot of tall stacks to send it elsewhere. That's economic sense. Have the benefits of one state, the burdens in another state. And of course, we have our elections. People are elected on two, four, and at most six-year cycles. The voters care about now. 
the here and now. There are no voters that many who do the there and then. And certainly the donors, the campaign donors, care about the here and now. Makes it very hard to pass these laws. And that's why it's sort of amazing that it happened. Most political scientists would say environmental law will never happen. You can't possibly get this political system to actually pass those kinds of laws, but it happened. So why did it happen? A few things. One is fears and aspirations. Fears, Rachel Carson's book in the 1960s. It woke up America to the notion that there were hazards and concerns. You know, people literally would run and dance as they did the pesticide spraying in neighborhoods. You know, this was a miracle chemical, and it did a lot of really good things. But people were unaware of the risk, and Rachel Carson, right, broadcast it. People also recognized for the first time how technology, which was fabulous, could also now cause destruction. With spatial and temporal, right, dimensions never before realized. You actually could have a bomb, right, that could... Right? Destroy life for the foreseeable future on Earth. When I was young, and a few people in this room, literally, there'd be on the, on the news, there'd be the doomsday clock. How close are we getting to midnight? And the, and the environmental movement embraced that rhetoric. It was the population bomb with the toxic time bomb. The idea was there are time issues here. There's an immediacy, there's an urgency to it. It was a time of extraordinary divide and unrest in the country, the late 1960s. A time of great sadness, of tragedy. It was a time where we had a nation divided by generation, by the war, by civil rights. And environmental law and environmentalism in the late 60s offered the potential for bringing the country together. It was something that people could agree about. They could move to. It was positive. And a lot of the civil rights workers, a lot of the college elites from the East, they then formed in the 60s, the environmental groups. It's no happenstance, right? That it's the Natural Resource Defense Council, the Environmental Defense Fund, then the Sierra Club Legal Defense Fund. Why? It was the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. They were all modeled themselves after Thurgood Marshall at the time. So the country is looking for something to go together with, and then this happened, right? Mercury is found everywhere. People started realizing, where can you go? Where can you, what can you eat? And then an extraordinary event, and there are times, right? Satellite TV technology brought this into people's living rooms for the first time. They could see live rivers on fire. They could see the oil spill in Santa Barbara, live on television. And then in the summer, of 69, this happened. At the beginning of the decade, a very young John F. Kennedy said, by the end of the decade, we will put a human being on the moon. And it happened. Our young president was no longer there, but we did. But when it happened, when those first pictures came back from the moon of the Earth, this enormous technological achievement, people looked at it and the reaction was different than what we'd supposed. It was, huh, it looks fragile. That's it? It's fragile out there. We have to protect it. It wasn't a source of great strength. It was a source of, we have to protect where we are. It started to embed our culture, widely accepted. Everyone may really know of the wonderful musical Hair. And the famous song, of course, is Hair or Age of Aquarius. That's not the song I like. The song I like is this one. Listen to the lyric. Or, of course, Tony Mitchell. Uh -huh. 
No, until it's gone. My favorite, top singles hit, early 1970s, Marvin Gaye, Mercy, Mercy Me. But if you really know the song, you know its title is not just Mercy, Mercy Me. It is the ecology. Look at his lyrics. Oh, better, listen to them. Same thing, right? There was a political opportunity and no one was more adept at spotting a political opportunity than Richard Nixon. New elected, takes office in 1969, justice is happening. And he sees his likely opponent in the 1972 election, the former vice presidential candidate with Hubert Humphrey, Ud Muskie from Maine. Muskie was championing the environmental issue. He was chair of the Subcommittee on Air and Water Pollution in the Senate. And Nixon decided he was going to take the environmental issue away from Muskie, outflank him for the 72 election so he could win that election. So what did Nixon do? He became an incredible environmentalist. January 1st, 1970, he signs the law of the National Environmental Policy Act, called the Magna Carta of Environmental Law. July, he starts the plan to create EPA. Earth Day, does a presidential message, fabulous environmental message in February of 70. And the last day of the year, he signs into law the Clean Air Act. We have one of the most important environmental planning and our first major pollution control law in the United States, a terrific law. And look what happened in the 1970s. Law after law after law after law passed by Congress, overwhelming bipartisan majorities, overwhelming, like 10 to one or 20 to one. Democrats, Republicans, incredibly demanding pollution control laws and natural resource management laws, one after the other. It's surprising persistence. It's one thing to pass it, another thing to maintain it. So Nixon realized pretty quickly by 1971, this was not a good political issue. He was getting nothing for it. He's getting no credit. These are notes of his chief of staff, H.R. Holdman, meetings he had in February 71. After the 70 midterms, he realized he had not gotten any reward, any return for what he had done in 1970. So he turned. Aspion, it's not worth a damn. An easy feeling we're doing too much. It's not a good political issue. It's only a good defensive issue. We're caving the left too much in all this. We can't play up the idea of destroying the system. So he started to question it. By June of 71, you should, you should take on the environment. It's not a sacred cow. Our whole line of responsibility, that's hard to sell. Ultimately, it is freedom from big government. Genius. You can't sell people politically on being responsible. You can sell them on freedom from big government. Sound familiar? Nixon spotted it right away and has been the template for a lot of presidential candidates ever since. July, we have to go back, look at all the pollution bills in terms of current economic effect, right, here and now. Let's see what the damage is. Put the brakes on where we can without getting caught. Economics is more important than cutting off musky. So he vetoes the Clean Water Act. 1972. People always say all the stuff that happened in the Nixon administration. Did, they always say, and the Clean Water Act. No, he vetoed the Clean Water Act. He vetoed in October 72. Look what happened. 
bam, be over, overridden. Like the next day, 247 to 23 in the house, right? 52 to 12 in the Senate. And this is not an unpopular president. And that his Congress is no, no, we're not having, we're bought into this now. He's not unpopular. Look what happens a few weeks later. He wins by a lot. It's not close. So this is a president who's powerful, who's winning by a landslide, and the Congress bucks him on environmental stuff. Ronald Reagan comes in, he has got the line, right? The problem is government. Government's not the solution, government's the problem. They interview to head EPA and Gorsuch, and she has asked her in the interview, are you willing to bring EPA to its knees? And what happens? Congressional collision with Democrats and Republicans. And she's forced out quickly by 83. It's almost exactly 40 years ago to the day, March 1983. She's forced out. The laws I have a fight in them now, and they're fighting back. Who takes her place? Bill Ruckles Johnson. And this guy over here, I think, was helping out, Jim Barnes. They come in, and they are beloved, cheered by the career people, and cheered by the environmentalists. Reagan had no choice but to put them in, because this was being a tough issue. But what happens in the, in the 80s? The laws get harder and tougher than ever before passed by bipartisan majorities in Congress, and every single one is signed by the President of the United States. None is vetoed. Reagan doesn't veto any of them during that time. And these are really tough laws, tougher even than before. Then ever since then, we've had this whipsawing, right? From Bush to Clinton, from Clinton to Bush, from Bush to Obama, from Obama to Trump, and from Trump to Biden. I couldn't get a picture of the two of them together, by the way. Sorry. But back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. With congressional paralysis and stalemate. And just a whipsaw in terms of our policies. So we go from one to the next. But through all that time, the basic statutes and regulations have actually remained in place. What happened in the 70s and the 80s. Clinton comes in, Clinton did not have an environmental bone in his body. He had been governor of Arkansas, he was terrible for the environment. So much so that when he received the Democratic nomination in 1988 and the National Sierra Club endorsed him, the Arkansas Sierra Club leaders all resigned in oh. protest. He put Gore on for that reason, to protect his left. Gore had just published a few months before Earth in the Balance, calling climate change this existential threat of catastrophe. We could not let politics get in the way. He put Gore there to protect him on the left. Two years in, Contract with America comes in. The Clinton administration had the House, had the Senate, healthy majorities, both. They lose most immediately. And all their ambitions for legislation are gone. We've had congressional paralysis ever since. Environmental law was a main focus of the contract with America. Did a lot of stuff during the Clinton administration, but none of them with Congress. Congress was gone. You need Congress. You need it, but it's gone. Bush and Gore come in, right? This is the 2000 election. Gore loses, Bush wins. What's the state? What's the state that made the difference? Wrong. West Virginia. If West Virginia had switched, Gore would have won. West Virginia had almost always gone Democratic until this year. Why do you think they didn't go Democratic this year? 
And they've been Republican ever since. Cole. It was coal, it was coal strip mining re- regulations promoted during the Clinton administration, which sunk West Virginia for Gore. That's historic. Gore comes in, sorry, Bush comes in. They've got a tie in the Senate, which means that they break it. And they got the Republican majority in the House. For the first time ever, we now have White House and both chambers of Congress set to actually cut back on the environmental laws. It looks like it's going to happen. And what happens? This happens. Senator from Vermont, James Jeffords, announces a few months in he's going to switch and vote with the Democrats. Why? Because he was upset with the early policy decisions of the Bush administration on environmental issues. What did he get for switching? He became chair of the Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works. So once again, environmental law, pushback. Barack Obama comes in. He's got huge majorities in the House and the Senate. By June of 2009, he's got 60 in the Senate, voting on the Democratic side. Huge. What does he accomplish? Lots of regulation. No legislation as I'll talk about in a moment, no legislation. He has to do it by regulation, ambitious regulation. This is the source of what we now call the major question doctrine. It's the pushing of these statutes, these old statutes, which takes a lot of creative interpretation to try to deal with modern problems, which the statutes weren't contemplating when the language was written. And that push is what led to, has led to a pushback in the courts called the major question doctrine. One example was the clean water rule, a rule which took a broad geographic scope of the Clean Water Act, how far it goes. Huge pushback, huge pushback by farmers who thought this is going to interfere with our private property rights, our way of life here in Indiana and other Midwestern states as well. And it led to a fabulous ad, which I love. It's a brilliant ad. And it's a, it's a populism, the rebellion of the here and now, that partly leads the election of Donald Trump. Donald Trump ran on these issues. Almost no one had ever run on environmental issues before Donald Trump. Maybe George Bush in 1980 said he'd be the environmental president. Trump does. The message is different, right? He takes advantage of all the reasons why it's hard to make environmental law and he exploits them, and it works. He wins. He wins on that mandate, and unlike some, he goes on it. He actually targets almost every single initiative of the Obama administration, every single one, for reversal. But he runs into problems, the courts. Now, part of this was a self-inflicted wound, because Trump was so extreme in his rhetoric that he could not get the A-team of Republican lawyers in the administration. 
there are fabulous Republican lawyers out there who believe the environmental laws have gone too far in different respects. But they would not go to the administration. He couldn't get the B team of environmental lawyers. He got the C team. And they didn't trust the career people, which is one reason they lost a lot of cases, many of which they didn't have to lose. Biden comes in, immediately targets reversal of all the Trump rules. This is not the way, right, to address these issues in a coherent way or in a timely way. But that's where we've been for the past 20 years. Super problem of climate change. Just a few thoughts on it. This is the problem, right? You take the here and now to the there and then, and you put it on steroids. Because you're talking about regulation of here and now for the benefit of there and then of extraordinary dimensions. We're not talking about a few miles, a few thousand miles. We're talking all around the globe. It's one uniform concentration in the atmosphere, but dramatically different effects. You're talking about not decades, but hundreds or a thousand more years. What you put up there stays up there. Carbon dioxide stays up there and accumulates over time. It's unbelievably hard. It outstrips the reach of any marketplace. It outstrips the reach of any government to be able to handle, which is why it's been so difficult. And time, right? This New York Times article yesterday says time is a big issue. If you don't address climate change soon, at some point, there are tipping points. The glaciers, right? How the Gulf Stream moves. Um, it's huge, massive. And the longer you take, the exponentially harder it is to do anything about it. You elect Al Gore, there he is, right? Existential, he says, this is the threat, this is the threat of time. Politics can't, you know, this is their theme song. Yeah, but he stopped thinking about tomorrow. Why? Because he wanted to win. So they didn't do anything on climate. They didn't do any regulation eight years on climate. And they knew. The science was there then. I learned about it in college at Illinois in 1977 in my environmental chemistry class. It was really well known about climate change. It became more and more certain they didn't act. Why he wanted to win. Who actually campaigned saying they regulate carbon dioxide from power plants? George Bush did. He said he would. And actually, when he won, he put into place in his cabinet climate hawks. Christine Todd Whitman, she was presidential timber. She was one of the most famous politicians in the United States, Republican governor of New Jersey. She was a climate hawk. She took the job because of the climate issues. Colin Powell, Secretary of State, a climate hawk. He believed it destabilized the world, a major national security issue. He had a briefing on climate change one week after they took office. Not only is the rights the same, but no one, no one was more hawkish than this guy, Paul O'Neill, Secretary of Treasury. He came from Alcoa. When he interviewed for the job, he told Bush how he cared about climate. He talked about his nomination hearing. And before the first cabinet meeting, he went to the White House early and he put in front of every single chair of every cabinet member, a copy of a speech he had given a few years earlier comparing the threat of climate change, this is 2001, to nuclear holocaust. They were determined to get things through. John McCain was a climate hawk. He held the first hearings on this. I think go back to Paul Songus in the 1970s. The first hearings in the early 2000s. What happened? This guy. Dick Cheney came from the energy industry. He outmaneuvered them all. And he got Bush within a few weeks of the inauguration to renege on his campaign promise because of the energy industry. Huge missed opportunity. That led to the decision of Massachusetts versus EPA, which basically said that was unlawful. Greenhouse gases are air pollutants. And you have to explain to me whether or not they endanger public health and welfare. Obama took it and ran with it on the climate issue. He believed in it. This is what he said right after taking office a week later. 
The insurgent dangers to our national and economic security are compounded by the long term threat of climate change, which, if left unchecked, could result in violent conflicts, terrible storms, shrinking coastlines, and irreversible catastrophes. These are the facts. These are the facts. What could they do politically? He put into place everyone who believed in climate change in the executive branch, in the Senate, and in the House. A lot of Californians. They all want to get legislation through. And he had the votes, right? 59, actually, 60 to 41 in the Senate, 257 to 178 in the House. Those are healthy majorities. What happened? It passed the House, barely. And that was by shenanigans. 3 a.m., they passed the House. It never got a vote in the Senate. Never got a vote. Why? Because they were too worried about the votes of the here and now in 2010. And the Democrats did not, Harry Reid did not want, the Democratic Senate did not want to have to vote on this issue. They thought it would hurt them. There was the Affordable Care Act competition as well, but it was really political. They never held a vote on the climate legislation. And they got ripped apart in the 2010 election. As Obama said, a shellacking. And that was the end of climate legislation in the United States. In 2009, everyone thought it was about to pass. In 2010, it was gone. And it was not happenstance, right? Dramatic change in the, in the Senate and the House. And climate change was part of the Tea Party mantra. Not, they targeted people they thought in the House who had voted for climate legislation very effectively. They thought it was world government. They thought it would hurt the here and now. I remember the day after the climate legislation passed in the House, I happened to land at Indianapolis airport. I was driving to Urbana, Illinois to visit my, my parents. It turned on the radio, and I heard on talk radio, right, nonstop about the climate legislation, what it was going to do to your utility bills. Climate change became like Baltimore the issue that shall not be named. Barack Obama said the word climate change global warming about 100 times in 2009, about 100 times in 2010. He did not utter it once, or one time, excuse me, in 2011, January 2011. It was written everywhere, don't talk about it. It's not a good political issue. It's gonna hurt you. He didn't start talking about it until after his reelection in 2012. And they did a lot, all by regulation not by legislation, including, of course, signature to the Clean Power Plan, court struck down. Then Trump wins. And Trump exploited this issue. Trump didn't run away from it. He took everything that made it a super wicked problem. He took advantage of politically. Right? He said, right, it's a hoax. That's the uncertainty over long periods of time. He said, I dig coal. I'm going to help the workers. I'm going to help the people of the United States. He took us out of Paris, saying, right, I care about people here in this country. I don't care about people in other countries. Took advantage of it all the way along. Infrastructure Investment Act, we now finally have some legislation being passed for the first time. That, and of course, the Inflation Reduction Act. But these are following, these are budget bills. We're doing it by spending. We can avoid the filibuster. There's no laws actually changing the statutes that they need to be changed. We're trying to buy our way in. It, these are important laws. They're going to do a lot of stuff. There's a lot of pork in them to try to get these things passed. But they're very important. But it's still second best. Next 50 years, just a few closing thoughts. Environmental law, enormous success story. It's extraordinary how much our country is cleaner, its air and its water, than, in, than it started in the 1970s. And that's with enormous economic growth. Vehicle, vehicle miles traveled, industry growth. We didn't have those statutes <clears throat> accompanying that growth. It's not hard to imagine what would have happened. Look at Eastern Europe. So very successful on any kind of measurement. With gaps, right? <clears throat> Climate change biggest issue of all time. 
we've lost a lot of time. We've lost 30 years so far. Those are 30 costly years. If you go to an environmental law professor's office, you'll see in all of our offices the same thing. Right next to our desk, look at the wall, there's a dent there. Because we've been banging our heads against them for 30 years. And now, of course, the Supreme Court with its own hurdles. Last thing I want to say is the fallacy of the arc of history argument. This is my unfavorite argument of all time. When I hear students say they're against right, the arc of history, I go, what makes you think that history goes the way you think it's supposed to go? It doesn't. Donald Trump made history. If you want to make history, which has to happen here on many issues of climate, you have to fight for it. You have to fight for history. And you're not going to do it just in the courts. You're not going to bring a lawsuit. It's going to be in the ballot box. It's going to be in local elections and state elections and federal elections. That's ultimately the story of Burma law. It happened in the 70s. It's persisted because of public support. It's wavered. And this is a challenging time. But for a law student, if you're interested in this area, what an important time and what an exciting time. Thanks a lot. Drive right time. We're over a little bit, so it's up to you. Leave, no. So any, any questions? If they're not, are there? Okay. Um, so I, I, thank you. That was a brilliant lecture. It was just, uh, you know, both incredibly engaging. Well, I was partly motivated because Jeff Stake told me there was a professor who was the faculty here before I was, who then left here and go to Yale. And he came and gave one of the worst talks ever. So I said, I can beat that. You definitely beat that. This was, uh, this was a great one. Thank you so much. It was, um, you know, not only was it incredibly informational and educational, but also really entertaining and fabulous. So thank you very much. Um, I wanted to actually just, um, and thank you for having that slide up actually, because the, the contrast between the cover of the new edition of your book and the first edition of your book, I think challenges your own statement that environmental law has been successful by all measures, because there are certainly measures by which it has not been successful. And I, so I- I, I didn't you, say by all measures, but- Oh, okay, I, 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 maybe I misheard. Um, I, I, I wonder if you could talk a bit about the spaces where you see optimism for successes on the issue of climate, and whether that's in environmental law or whether it's somewhere else. So right. for example, the emergence of, of the, the rights of nature, um, or if there are other avenues that you see yeah. as being potentially- the, Things like the right to nature, those things, other countries, absolutely, not in the United States. Yeah. Uh, there, there's some very important decisions uh, made in other countries uh, involving sort of public trust doctrine theories and constitutional law theories with courts playing a, a very proactive, aggressive role in those, in those countries of ultimately limited practical import, but of, of very important symbolic. We don't have that tradition here. We're not going to have that happen. The courts are not going to uh, say there's a constitutional right to sustainable environment. The Giuliani case, a wonderful case. They're not going to do it. It's not going to happen through our judicial system here. So I think in other countries, reason we're optimistic, here it's not the judicial system. They'll, they'll play a very important role in keeping people to those statutes like Mass versus EPA, but they're not going to take this issue over uh, the way people hope they will. They're not going to do it. It's just not our tradition. For lawmaking here, liberal or conservative, Democrat, Republican judges, they're not there. Uh, you wouldn't get, uh, I think you'd lose that nine to zero in the Supreme Court. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be like five to four or six to three. Um, where, where you see, I think, reason or optimism here um, is um, one, I think a lot of state and local governments, some states are really leaders in this area uh, and they're very important. Uh, California, among others, not the only one. Uh, there are some states doing some very ambitious things, and they're showing this can work, that actually the here and now can live with protecting the there and then. 
So there's been very important models being done in little laboratories. I'd rather have national legislation, but things are happening in the states, especially right now in adaptation, which is adapting to climate change, which is more like here and now, the mitigation reducing the greenhouse gases. The other thing that's happening is our marketplace. Uh, and that is, um, if you drive now from here to Urbana, Illinois, you go through those fields, what are those fields full of? Windmills, it's all windmills on all those farmers' property. Um, the economics of right, clean energy are taking over and they're outpacing the fossil fuel industry. When the clean power plan was struck down by the Supreme Court or they, they upheld the repeal of it, its goals were to achieve a certain level of reduction from the fossil fuel plant by 2030, came out in, in 2015. It never went into effect because it was saved by the Supreme Court. But by 2019, we already met the clean power plant goals without the clean power plant. Why? Because the marketplace. Coal can't compete. It can't compete with the new emerging. So there's a lot to be done by the private sector representing and promoting what are called the climate disruptors as opposed to the incumbents. I'm teaching a new class this spring for the first time at, at Harvard called climate lawyering. Not about climate law, about climate lawyering. And that's because most of my students aren't going to be experts in the Clean Air Act and they're not going to want to work for EPA or whatever, but they're going to become lawyers. And you need lawyers who are corporate law experts and energy law experts and agricultural law experts and transportation law experts and patent experts and securities education regulation, financial risk experts and the Federal Reserve. They're the ones who have to be there advocating for changes which let this new technology come in. So climate lawyering is not just the Clean Air Act. Summit Lorraine is letting this entire transformation transition happen, and that happens in lots of areas of law. Yeah, William. Thank you, Professor, for a very engaging lecture. To build on the previous question, um, one of the difficulties you mentioned is that individual voters have difficulty enduring costs now for a gain distant in the future. One way to get around this you just mentioned is industry and clean energy is motivating to some members of the population. Are there other ways that we can motivate individual voters to do their part to contribute to avoiding climate change in a similar way? Yeah, part of it is make them, I think, better appreciate uh, the effects right now. I mean, we, we're, if you look at it, everyone's always talking about the wildfires now, the storms now, the drought now. I mean, there's been an effort. And the fact is, a lot of that is true, uh, that we are now actually having effects now. But it seems to be no way to get, unless you have more of a spiritual society, uh, there are different cultures which are better at caring about the there and then than the United States, which tends to be more of myopia. It's more about the here and, and now. Uh, is making people realize the here and now effects uh, of it. And that's what we're trying to do. And, and, it, and I, I say, one of the biggest mistakes I ever thought was made politically was Al Gore's movie, An Inconvenient Truth. People love that movie. I hated the movie. I walked out of the movie furious because Al Gore took this important issue and he politicized it. If you watch that movie, how does it begin? It begins with pictures of the count of Florida of the, of the votes and the chads. It becomes of the 2000 election. And then if you look at it, he stands on a lecture. He stands on a thing and he lectures people about the truth. Oh, great, right? And he says how he learned about this at Harvard. This is not the way to address the American people. He made it about him and how smart he was, how he would tell people the truth. And he stood and he lectured people. You, that's not how to present this issue politically in the United States. It is show people that there is actual risks to their lives, their livelihoods, and those of their loved ones, and it show them that there's opportunity. If we spent a fraction of the money which is spent on political campaigns to help some of these transitional communities get sort of better jobs in a new economy, we'd be far better off. That's where I think there's hope. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for taking the time. Yeah. Um, just really quickly, uh, was curious if you had any thoughts about the uh, national environmentalist movement on a whole, and if there was something that you think, I think a lot of environmentalism works through uh, ideology and attempting at 
ideological persuasion to encourage change. I wonder if you might have any thoughts on uh, a change you wish that you could affect in the national movement. Yeah, in that I, way. it's a great question. I wrote an article a long time ago called Fairness in Environmental Law um, because I've always been worried that the national groups care exclusively about getting the right level of pollution. I should go getting the right level of pollution going down. They don't, they don't pay attention to the effects on people, the transitional effects. Uh, when, when you have legal change happen slowly, the market takes care. If it happens quickly, environmental needs quickly, there are people who are legitimately caught in the bind and their, their expectations, their livelihoods are legitimately dashed, um, like the miners in West, or some farmers as well. Environmentalists need to pay attention to fairness. They need to pay attention to distribution. They need to pay attention to transition and taking care of the communities. Uh, and they haven't done that. Uh, they've been, they, they seem too much like elitists. They seem like they're just outsmarting. They don't listen to communities. They don't talk to them. This is true in the environmental justice issue, uh, but it's true writ large. Uh, this is one by one real hurdle we're going to have, which I, worries me a lot. And that is we need to act quickly on the climate issue. We need to put up transmission facilities to deal with the electricity grid. We need to do more lithium mining for the battery. All kinds of things we have to do fast. That is going to write into environmental justice. The environmental justice is about process and time and inclusion. It doesn't like haste because they know when things are unhasty, they lose. But that's going to be a challenge. Okay. One more. Oh no! You, I think you have to. Mary, Mary will 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 shoot me if you don't. All right. So you mentioned your uh, um, class you're teaching in the fall. He's a first year law student, but yeah, I am. Hi. <laughs> Uh, you mentioned your class you're teaching in the fall on uh, climate lawyering. Right, right now, actually. Um, sorry. Um, in, in different areas that uh, people could be climate lawyers, are there any places that you see a role for people taking on environmental law that is outside of you know the typical courtroom um, that maybe isn't as commonly oh. conceptualized in the American public oh, that you absolutely. think has? Oh, absolutely. Great. Okay. Absolutely. I'm a litigator. So I'm a courtroom guy. I don't think where that's most of the action is going to be in environmental law. Uh, it's going to be in corporate transactions, it'll be corporate law, it's going to be a lot in the private sector, because there is right now, it, like a private sector wanting to say, we can make a mint, right, off of, you know, new technologies and services, which don't emit so many greenhouse gas. We can do it with adaptation services. That's fine with me. I mean, if the, if the private sector has that incentive, so I think a lot of it's not going to be litigation. A lot of it's going to be sort of helping to nurture that new economy and getting the old economy out of the way uh, and the reg and the rights and regulations which impede the introduction of the new economy. I think a lot of very important lawyering is not going to be in the courtroom. Courtroom is when things break down. Courtroom is a very inefficient way to get things done. It's one of the beauties of our system is keeping people to the law. Badly. But this kind of paradigm bashing is going to require, it's going to require legislation require private sector initiative, it require military leaders to explain to the American people the national security risks associated with this as well. Thank you. Can I, can I do one last thing, just per, personal privilege? I wanna show you this picture. Most of you won't know this person, a few will. That's Terry Bethel, who was on the faculty here for years. I've always owed a debt of gratitude to Terry Bethel. Uh, when I was on the market for teaching jobs in the fall of 82, uh, I went to the double ALS, American Association of Law School. And I did not have an interview when I flew to the interview, meat market, we called it. Um, I did not have an interview with the school anywhere near as good as Indiana. And I wrote a series of notes on yellow paper and put them in folders of different Big Ten schools, having been a product of Big Ten school myself. That was my dream job. I put in folders of different Big Ten schools saying, here's my resume. Uh, if you have any time, I'd love to talk to you. I got a note from Terry Bethel. I got a note back saying, can you stop by our hotel room in Chicago at 5.30 at the end of the day, which I did. Um, he wrote me the note, always grateful. Indiana took a chance. Uh, and that is where we have something in common. 
Uh, Indiana launched me as an academic. It's launching the students as lawyers. Uh, and for that, I think we'll all be grateful. Thanks a lot. Yeah, I, I get it, Terry never comes in. Yeah. 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 Yeah.